Well, this Sunday is uh, really a treat, um, and this weekend has been. Uh, the ladies at the Women's Conference got to hear from Pam Hardy at the Women's Conference, and this morning we get to hear from her husband, Carrie Hardy. Uh, one of the blessings, as you know, if you've been around Grace Bible Church for a while, of taking seriously Christ's instruction for training men and raising up leaders in the local church is that we have a constant supply for uh, our pulpit. And one of the drawbacks, if you can call it a drawback, is that we don't often hear from men outside of our, our local church. Uh, so this morning is, is one of those days where we actually get to hear from another faithful pastor and preacher, uh, not at Grace Bible Church. A little bit about Kerry Hardy. Uh, he's a man of, of many talents. He was, in a former life, a pharmacist uh, before entering into ministry. Uh, he sold that pharmacy. He entered into ministry, spent a number of years in Texas as a principal of a Christian school and a minister of music in his local church. He graduated from the master's seminary with an MDiv degree and then later served on the pastoral staff of Grace Community Church in Los Angeles that we're uh, really familiar with. While he was on pastoral staff there, he also served as a professor at the Master's University and the Master's Seminary. And since 2006 has been serving as the senior pastor of Twin City Bible Church in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And uh, maybe more impressive than all of those accomplishments is that he's been married to Pam Hardy for 46 years and, and does not look old enough to have been married that long. So, Carrie, thank you so much for being here. Uh, please come and bless us with uh, the preaching of God's word. Well, what a privilege it is for Pam and me to be with you here this weekend. I know my wife's heart was refreshed in her time with the ladies Friday and uh, Saturday. And it's just a joy uh, to be here with you to worship and study God's word uh, this morning. Thank you to the elders, the leaders of this church for allowing me this great uh, privilege. It's always exciting to go somewhere and to find believers that share the same uh, priorities and joys that you do. You love the same uh, Savior, Christ, the living word, and you love his written word. And so we quickly feel at home, more at home with you than we would with some of our blood relatives, you know, who don't love Christ. Maybe you have that experience when you go to family reunions and you're just not of the same worldview, even though biologically you might be related. So thank you for giving us the opportunity of fellowshipping with you here this uh, morning. You can make your way to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 if you'd like. Well, do it whether you like it or not. You should do it. That's what we're here for. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. If you're having trouble finding it, it's right after chapter 6 there in that same, same book. If I were to ask you this morning what time it is, my guess is you would likely look at your watch or you would look at a clock or you would look at your phone. Well, I am asking you that question. What time is it? But I do not mean what a clock would say. There is a word for that kind of time in Greek, the most common word for that is chronos, that's clock time, watch time, and obviously mankind throughout human history has sought to uh, manage it, sought to utilize it in some way. Early on to tell time, man would look at shadows and uh, eventually a sundial. I was thinking about that recently, studying through the Gospel of John on Sunday mornings at Twin City Bible Church, where I have the joy of serving. I'm at uh, John chapter 
19, and it's discussing the events of Jesus' trial before Pilate, and then Pilate handing him over to the soldiers to be crucified. It makes the comment that it was about the 11th hour, but you read the book of Mark, and it says it was the ninth hour. So <clears throat> which is it, the ninth hour or the 11th hour? And the answer is yes, because of the way they had to tell time. They didn't carry watches, wear watches. They didn't carry phones around. They would look at a sundial or get out <clears throat> astronomical charts. They didn't carry those around either, sundials, astronomical charts. They would estimate the time based on where the sun is in the sky, and two different individuals could estimate it differently. One might look at the sun and, and make a comparison from where it had come at sunrise and say it's about the ninth hour. Someone else might look at where the sun is and where it's headed toward noon and say it's about the 11th hour. That was just the nature of trying to measure time in those days. Now it's so different. We have the most accurate clocks in the world to measure it. We have calendars and apps to somehow try to manage it in our lives. I even have a clock in our bedroom that projects the time on the ceiling so that when I wake up during the middle of the night, which happens frequently, I can know exactly how much sleep I'm not getting. <laughs> I can already tell how exhausted I will be the next day. It's important to us at some level, chronos. It's a, it's a linear measurement, you could say. It's, it's quantitative. You're looking at a, at a linear sequence of Moments, there's this idea of duration maybe that's being emphasized, but this morning what I'm thinking of is another Greek term, not chronos, but kairos. Kairos is found about 86 times, I think it is, in the New Testament. It's used to describe, can be used to describe, and frequently does this, periods of time. And the significance of those periods of times it can look at that season of time and the opportunities that are there. It's an appointed time, an appointed season that leads to a call for decisive action. So you can, you can see the difference there. Kronos is a, is a measurement of something. Kairos is more about thinking. It's about your perception. So when I ask you what time it is this morning... I don't want you to look at your watch or the phone. I'm asking you to set Kronos aside for a moment. And I understand how important it is to us. And it feels like a treadmill that we're running on a lot. Get off of that treadmill this morning. We, we want to discern the Kairos of our lives. And that means instead of looking at a, at a clock or a watch, we're going to be looking at our hearts. Now, we do find this term in our text this morning, 1 Corinthians 7. We're going to be studying verses 29 through 31 of 1 Corinthians 7. And we're familiar with this chapter. 1 Corinthians 7 is a chapter that, especially as pastors, we frequently go to this chapter to answer questions about marriage, about physical intimacy in marriage, about celibacy, about <clears throat> singleness, divorce, remarriage. It's a very important chapter. But in the middle of this chapter, Paul suddenly makes some very unusual statements. And I'll confess to you, the first time I read these statements, I, I found them perplexing. I mean, there, there are some startling assertions here. And, and yet, as I studied what's here, there is this rhythm to it that's almost poetic and there certainly is a paradoxical nature to the content here, and all of that makes these verses some of the most profound in this letter. So let me read for us 1 Corinthians 7, verses 29 to 31. But this I say, brethren, the time has been shortened, so that from now on those who have wives should be as though they had none. And those who weep as though they did not weep, and those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice, and those who buy as though they did not possess, 
And those who use the world as though they did not make full use of it, for the form of this world is passing away. Now, before this section in verses 25 to 28, <clears throat> Paul has been discussing essentially whether or not to get married. And he was doing that because of the challenging nature of the circumstances of that day in which he lived, which included a, a great famine. So in one sense, we could say that, that these verses are part of that discussion, that they just inject another factor into that discussion. And yet it's also true that the beginning of verse 29, when you look at those, those words, but this I say, you see that this is also a transition of some sort, a transition to a new point. You see that pronoun this, that refers now to what follows, not to what has already been said. Also, notice the term brethren there, verse 29. That signals that Paul is broadening what he's saying here to address everyone. What he is saying now moves far beyond the topic of marriage and any concerns about that subject. The Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Spirit, is bringing all of us to consider one of the most important truths in Scripture, and that is that someday... Everything we know about the world is going to come to an end. Everything. All forms of society. Everything we know about this present life is going to change forever. This is a central point here. That because of that, we should rethink our present existence in light of that truth about the time in which we live. You find the truth about the time in which we live in a very dramatic statement there in verse 29. The time, and that's kairos. The time has been shortened. Now, we really do need to combine that thought to what's found at the end of verse 31. So go ahead and jump to the end of verse 31 and see that, that expression there, how he concludes, the form of this world is passing away. So the time, the kairos has been shortened, and the form of this world is passing away. We're going to keep those two statements together just for a moment here because they give us the basis for the appeal that Paul is making to us. But it is important not to misinterpret those statements. You might read those and think that, well, I, I get it. Paul is just making the point that, you know, life is short. Everyone's going to die at some point. I'm like 115 years old, so it's, surely it's close. Well, that is a reality. Our, our lives are short compared to the timeline of history. It's just that that's not the meaning here. So before we walk through the text, let's spend a moment examining these two statements, the basis for what Paul is going to tell us. The time has been shortened. The kairos, the form of this world is passing away. Here's a, here's a little examination of that first statement, the time is shortened. As I've already noted, kairos here in this verse is designating a particular period, a, a span of time, if you will, a, a season in God's plan. So what season is that? What period? Well, Paul is using the term here to refer to the, the period of time that started with Christ first coming into the world, God taking on human flesh, coming into the world, including his life, his death, his resurrection from the grave, and the period that then ends with an event that's still to come in the future, the second coming of Christ, still future when he comes in power and glory. Just like the original readers of this letter, we live as well in that time, the specific appointed period of time, this kairos. So for us, there is a portion of this period that remains in each of our lives. You could even think of it that way. From this moment of our discussion today until the second coming, 
the future, there's a portion of the kairos that still remains. But regardless of when we live in this kairos, in this span of time, what he says here is true. It has been shortened, which is more literally a term that carries the idea of being compressed. In other words, the future for God's people and this kairos has been compressed. And even the future is is brought forward in such a way that we can see it clearly. Now, perhaps a reasonable illustration is a telephoto lens on a camera. You remember those, don't you, cameras? You could have a telephoto lens. I had one. And you can put that telephoto lens on and you can, you can turn it. And so whatever you're, you're looking at, maybe a bird way off in the distance, it makes the object you're, you're viewing appear to be closer to you. And, and of course, the distance hasn't changed. Only your ability to see it more clearly has changed. That's a good illustration in a similar way. Scripture for us is like a telephoto lens. It it brings the future forward. The, the, The period is compressed so that in Scripture we see what this period is all about, and we see what the future holds. And and since it's compressed in that sense, we can study it, and, and it's as if the events happen rapidly, changes occur quickly. And it doesn't mean that the end is is imminent. That's not really the point, although Scripture makes that point as well, that we should always live as if it's today. But rather, the point is that the future, which was set in motion at the beginning of this kairos by Christ's coming, is in plain view, so we understand what's going to happen. Not everybody does. Those who are not God's sheep, His people, they don't see this period correctly. They can't, but we do. So again, the overall point of the passage is that this reality, our ability to see the truth about this compressed time in the future, it ought to make a difference in how we do live now. In other words, the concern is not really about the amount of the chronos that we do have left in this age. The concern is the radical thinking that we ought to have in this compressed time, regardless of how much chronos we have left. We should live with altered values as to what counts, as to what is important and what is not. And that message is the same whether you lived in in 50 AD or you live in 2022. Gordon Fee gives this very helpful illustration. There's an analogy he writes with someone who's been diagnosed with a terminal illness. For that person, their thinking changes. The amount of time though it's, that they have left is, is, is important to some degree, but even more important is the change of perspective they have about their life now. They see things differently. They hear and value everything in a new way now. That's the first statement. Here's the second one. Found at the end. It it adds to the thought. The form of this world is passing away. The term for passing away is found only here in Paul's writings. You do find it in 1 John chapter 2. The apostle John uses it. But it's a figure that comes from something they were very familiar with in their world. The scenes of uh, the world of the theater and the scenes of a theater. They, they, they loved their plays and the scenes would change in the play. There'd be actors on a stage, stage but as the storyline progresses, as the play progresses, the scenes change. And so in a sense, the analogy is that, that we're, we're like in, in this play called life, we're the actors, the scene's going to change though. It's not just the outward appearance that's on the way out. Notice that term form. It's the word schema. The whole scheme of things as they currently exist is going to change. 
Now back to verse 29. Little expression, so that. That confirms why Paul is telling us about the kairos all of a sudden in this chapter. There's a purpose. God has a purpose for his people in compressing the time and causing the form to pass away. It's so that, he says, from now on until the end of this age in which we live, the church age, we could call it, so that believers might clearly see what's going on around them and end up having a totally new perspective as to their relationship to this world. We're going to see that we're not to leave the world. He's not calling us to do that. We're not to stop interacting with the world around us. He doesn't say that. But we are to keep a very light hold on everything that's earthly and therefore live free from the world's control. So back to my invitation to you this morning. We are pushing the pause button of the chronos, and we're going to look at some radical perspectives that we should have. We're going to rethink our present existence so that we live in a way that pleases the Lord. There are five radical perspectives here in this text that God says we need to have while we live in this compressed time. Just one caution, though, before I give you these five radical perspectives. Keep in mind that we're not meant to take the words too literally. If we do... These five perspectives become absurd. And they even would then contradict what Scripture says elsewhere. Just make sure we get the intent of what Paul says. Here's radical perspective number one. God expects, number one, a radical view of relationships. A radical view of relationships. Verse 29 continues. Those who have wives should be as though they had none. Now, Paul is not saying that married couples should be celibate. That would contradict verses 1 through 7 of the same chapter. That's a part of marriage that is a blessing from God to enjoy, a normal part. But individuals who are married are to remember something that is wonderful as marriage is, as important as marriage is, it is not the most important relationship. Our relationship to Christ is more important than our marriage. Pleasing Christ is more important than pleasing our spouse. 2 Corinthians 5.9, by the way, is a great life verse if you're just looking for one to memorize. Where Paul says, I have as my ambition, you know, my driving passion of my heart, whether dead or alive, to be pleasing to him. Why is that more important? Well, marriage is something temporary. It's only something that exists in this compressed age that we're in. I don't understand all the, all the intricacies of this about heaven. I do know what Mark 12, 25 says. When they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. There's something about heaven that's different, certainly, than here. We're not living in the, the marital relationships there that we have here in the same way. But it's not just marriage. All relationships are going to change. I mean, we are going to know each other, but we're going to be experiencing each other in an entirely new existence. Heaven's different than this compressed time. That'll help us not sentimentalize heaven too much. I hear people do that to heaven. I just can't wait to get there. I know grandma is going to be making her biscuits, you know, there. And I sure miss that. Looking forward to grandma's biscuits. Don't do that to heaven. It's more profound than that. What's Paul's point? We ought to be preparing for that eternal change now. That eternal change in all relationships. Marriage is not to be an idol. We can make an idol out of marriage. Our spouse is not to be an idol. Our children are not to be an idol. 
God alone is the object of our love, our supreme love, our supreme delight, our adoration. There, there's not to be anything else. No one else is to take the place of him in our lives. John Piper wrote this poem for his son's wedding. I don't know where I found this years ago. It's a really interesting poem. When his son got married, it's, it's entitled, Love Her More and Love Her Less. It's an interesting poem because each stanza tells his son to love his new wife more than something else. Love your wife more than wealth. wealth. Love your wife more than friends. Love your wife more than ease or fame or even breath itself. And, and, and always be sure to love her, though, less than God. And so the last stanza, these are the words. The greatest gift you give your wife is loving God above her life. And therefore, I bid you now to bless. Go love her more by loving her less. Meaning less than Christ. My wife and I cut our Christian music teeth on a songwriter and singer named Keith Green back in the dark ages, the late 70s back before electricity and some of those things. Keith Green wrote this song called, I, I Pledge My Head to Heaven. And, and he meant by that, by head, he meant himself. I pledge myself to heaven, he writes, for the gospel. And then he had a verse about his wife, and then he had a verse about his son. I pledge my son to heaven for the gospel. The verse about the wife, I'll never forget it though. It, it has somewhere in there, it says this, I pledge my wife to heaven for the gospel. I told her when we wed that I'd rather be found dead than to ever love her more than I love the one who saved my soul. That's the idea here. That's the perspective God expects about all relationships. They're important to us. They're part of this season that we live in. And we have love for those that we're in relationship with. We are to love our spouses. We are to love our children. We are to love our friends. We're to be grateful for them. We have biblical responsibilities that we are to take seriously and that we are to fulfill, but we are not to hold on to them too tightly. We're not to hold on too tightly to anything in this compressed existence. Just remember that radical perspective about relationships. Number two, the second radical perspective God expects, a radical view of trials, a radical view of trials. And frankly, out of the five, I think for many, this is the one that's the hardest to accept. Look at verse 30. And those who weep as though they did not weep. Now, he's not saying that we should live as if we have no emotions at all. God didn't make us that way. In fact, elsewhere in Romans chapter 12, Paul uses the same, uh, this term, uh, weep, there, when he talks about weeping with those who weep, it's the same term. He himself endured very intense struggles in his life. But those who grieve, if they're not careful... If they're not thinking rightly, they tend to be completely focused on their trial. They, can't be, they tend to be completely engrossed in their mourning. The whole world tends to revolve around them and their suffering and their trial, and they can end up becoming very self-focused. It happens. Well, the reality is that trials, disappointment suffering, unfulfilled expectations. It's a normal part of earthly existence. So we're not to let our, our sorrows get the best of us. We're not to allow our trials to incapacitate us. And it doesn't matter, matter whether it's a small trial or a great trial. We are to always be practicing trusting the Lord we're to put into practice the realization even that our suffering, our disappointment, our pain, our sorrow is not even the greater issue of this compressed time. Every one of those opportunities are given to us by the Lord to glorify Him in some way. 
We easily, though, become very devastated by the things that happen. We can be extremely upset, extremely troubled, discouraged, depressed, angry, silent. God is reminding us we need to choose not to be too upset about anything. We have reasons to be sad, and it's okay to be sad. We have reasons to grieve. We should. If you failed, okay, that's the reality. But don't let it consume you. It says those who weep should live as though they did not weep. As though. That's a radical perspective. Third, God expects, number three, a radical view of blessings. The other end of the pendulum swing, a radical view of blessings. Verse 30 goes on, and those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice. Now, joy is a part of our earthly experience. We have times and where we say we're on top of the world and, and, and you know, life is hitting on all eight cylinders or 12, how many ever your car has, and things are going well. And we ought to be known as Christians, as those who rejoice. We find a command to that regard in Philippians 4.4. And that command almost seems to contradict what's being said here. Rejoice always. Again, I say rejoice. Now it says, live as though you did not rejoice. Well, just like tears and sorrow, we're not to let our joy, our laughter, totally define who we are. Even the good things that happen to us, the times of of what we would call blessings, if you think about them objectively, they're just part of this present existence that's temporary. So be thankful, be joyful, but don't let your joy over the circumstance of your life that you're enjoying, don't let that be what overall controls you. Praise God for the blessings and the successes, but hold loosely to them. We're not to be too upset about anything, and we're not to be too elated about anything. (laughs) So you could summarize it and just say that, that every human emotion should be kept under control so that it's not excessive because we're remembering the truth about this compressed time. And then we'll fulfill what 1 Peter 1.13 says, to keep sober in spirit. It's a radical perspective. Radical view of relationships, a radical view of trials, a radical view of possessions. Number four, blessings, then now possessions. Look at verse 30 again, it continues. And those who buy as though they did not possess... Now, Scripture does not condemn possessions. Scripture doesn't discourage buying and selling. Scripture does not discourage, you know, carrying on business and doing it well and being successful. I mean, it's, again, it's a normal part of the experience of this world. At the very least, we need to be going to Walmart and Trader Joe's to carry on life. We have to purchase things. Some things we purchase are necessities. Some things we purchase are luxuries. Nothing wrong with that either. All fine. Be grateful for what you have. Christ himself used the concept of making a purchase in one of his parables, so there's nothing sinful about it. But such activities are not to divert a a true believer from the from the real purpose of life, the real business of life, that we're here to, to love and serve Christ. And we can get diverted from that, especially when it comes to possessions. We can start concentrating on our possessions to the point that something now, a material possession, consumes us. So the perspective we are to develop is this. Nothing we purchase, it doesn't matter how costly it is, must be of such importance to us that it becomes our complete preoccupation in this world. Or to put it in the terms of this verse, buy 
but buy as if you don't possess it. I remember this chapter from the book by A.W. Tozer, The Pursuit of God. I'm pretty sure it's a chapter in that book. And the chapter is called The Blessedness of Possessing Nothing. And he makes this point in there that you don't learn that by rote, you know, just on paper. You learn it by experience. How to own things, have things, but not own them, you could say. And just remember, everything we have is from God. It's, it's on loan from God, you could say. We're stewards of it. That includes our money. And we have it to enjoy it, that's for sure. We have it to use for Him, to invest in the kingdom. But all the while, we're enjoying things, buying things. We keep this radical perspective in our hearts, this radical view of possessions. We buy as though we don't possess Here's the fifth one. God expects, number five, a radical view of opportunities. A radical view of opportunities. Now, this fifth exhortation to us is the most general one. It it, it covers a lot, and therefore it is appropriate that it's the climax of the set. Verse 31. And those who use the world live this way, as though they did not make full use of it. So there are a lot of activities, our earthly activities that fit here under number five. All the many things we can devote our time to. All the many projects we can devote ourselves to. And there's a bottom line thought here. Unless the Bible prohibits prohibits something, then it's fine to take advantage of the various opportunities that come your way. It's fine to get involved in earthly endeavors and earthly pursuits. It's, it's fine to pursue goals and dreams. I mean, there is so much to experience in this earthly existence. There, there's so much in this life that we can benefit from. So you don't at all get the sense from Paul's writings here or er- elsewhere that he advocates some sort of extreme separatism. You know, I mean, just build a cabin up in the mountains and and live in it and lock the doors and pull the blinds down. No, we're not to live that way, but Christians are not to make full use of it. Now that verb is really the same as the first one that he says in verse 31, those who use the world. It is the same verb, but yet with a a prefix on it that intensifies it. And it only occurs twice in the New Testament here. And in chapter 9, Paul uses it where he makes that point about not taking full advantages, you know, of his rights as an apostle. One of those rights that he had was to receive financial support, and he chose not to do that. So he says in chapter 9, verse 18, I chose not to make full use of my right in the gospel. So there's the two places it's used. And and it means, with this intensive prefix, it means to be engrossed in something, to be absorbed in something. So the point is, Christians are not to be preoccupied with any of our earthly opportunities, our earthly resources, our earthly circumstances. We, We live as if we're detached from them, even as we pursue them. And again, what's on the list here? There's too many dimensions, so many goals and dreams we can have and and take steps to pursue. We are faced with so many potential activities to get involved in, so many careers that a person could choose to possibly delve into while you're here, so many hobbies to enjoy. So many causes to devote yourself to. So many things to learn. So many books to read. So many places to visit. So many foods to eat. When I go to Italy, I'm overwhelmed with so many flavors of gelato to to sample. 
There was a gelateria in Rome. It's out of business now, I heard. 150 flavors of gelato. So many house projects to get involved in. Pam and I have about eight of those going on right now. Each of these are great. Each of these are things that can be done by Christians and non-Christians alike. All fine. But get back and see the big picture. Ultimately, none of it matters. Because none of it's eternal. Why? Because of the reality concerning the world. And we've arrived at that second expression that we've already noted. The form of this world is passing away. Everything is part of a, of a present world existence that's a form that's passing away. So you can take anything that we've said here, any category. Marriage is part of the present scheme of things that's, that's on its way out. Trials and blessings are part of what is passing away. The ability to buy things and sell things, passing away. Resources, endeavors, opportunities that even make our lives full, they're passing away. So many things can be done or not done. It doesn't matter. Everything's part of a passing away world. There's something overarching that's higher up that matters. Captured in various verses of Scripture, like 1 Corinthians 10, 31. You know, everything we do, do to the glory of God. It's doing the work that He's called us to do. And awaiting then His reward in eternity. So while we're using the world, we don't make full use of it. We don't get absorbed into it. I think of it this way. It's that proverbial illustration of the, of the child that, that puts his hand in the jar of candy, you know, and reaches down in there and grabs as much as he can. And, and then he's got a problem. He can't get his hand out. <laughs> he's going to have to let go of some things. He's too greedy it's not just children who can do that, you see. So use the world. You can, you must. I'm not talking about the things that are clearly said in Scripture, no. But all the rest, just be careful. Don't fill your hand too full. Because the things you grip starts getting a grip on you and your heart. It, it, it brings... Clarity, or, or at least just a, this companion understanding of, of so many verses that, that say the same thing, that apply, like Colossians 3, verse 2. Said it differently there. Set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. Be heavenly minded as you live in this world. If you forget this eternal heavenly perspective, then we start gripping things too lightly. And it can happen so easily. It can happen in a subtle way. It, it, it happens kind of over time. We just get used to the, the truths that we're supposed to be living by. And, and we just don't hear the sound of them anymore like we used to. And we live, we live as if this is all there is. And then we fret and we worry because things are not going right here. So the lesson is this, don't, don't lose the sound of Scripture that keeps pointing you to the reality of the coming of the Lord and the truth about this kairos we lived in, so that nothing hinders our obedience to what God's called us to do and to live for. So you ask yourself this morning some questions about these categories. Are your relationships or your possessions, or your trials, or your work, or your hobbies, or your dreams, or your goals, your pursuits, are they really getting in your way, actually, of your relationship to the Lord? Then the solution is clear. Let go of your grip. Don't make full use of everything. Because then you're living your life upside down by wrong priorities. Just a couple of summary conclusions then from these radical perspectives, a radical view of relationships, of trials, of blessings, of possessions, and opportunities. 
And I'm sure there's more than these two summary conclusions. They're just the ones that maybe I came to. The first one is this. Sure makes sense, this first one, if all this is true, and it is, it's God's word. Your circumstances are never the most important issue. Your circumstances are never the most important issue. What's important? Always, who Christ is. Being obedient to him and pleasing him, that is. And see, that's true whether you're married or not married. Whether you're young or older. In fact, this is in the context of this chapter 7. You can definitely say this. Being single or married is not even the crucial question. Either one's okay in Scripture. What we experience, whether trials or blessings, it's just not ultimately important. Whether you own a little or whether you own a lot, whether you've been successful in reaching your dreams and your goals or not, it's just not the main thing. When we're thinking rightly, we're heavenly minded and we're marked by eternity. And when we're marked by eternity, it takes the edge off the troubles and the trials of our circumstances. It enables you as a believer then to persevere and endure a difficult marriage situation or some other circumstance. Some other circumstance that you, you just think of as it's unsatisfying, it's not what I want, or it's, it's difficult, or it's undesirable. Thinking rightly then helps you endure to the glory of God within that circumstance which is what 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says. God doesn't allow us to be tempted slash tested beyond what we're able. And what we go through is common to man anyway. But in the trial or the testing, he'll provide a way of escape. And our problem is we put a period there in the verse because we love that part. An escape, yeah. Yeah, well, there's not a period. More like a comma. Provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. That's how he defines escape in most of the situations we're in. So the bottom line is our identity doesn't have to be determined what's, what's happened to us in the past. What's happened to you in your past is part of this kairos that's passing away. It's not the ultimate determination of your identity. Don't grip it so tightly. What's happening in your present situation is not what determines your identity. What's going to happen yet in the future you don't know about? It's not it. Your identity is being in Christ in this kairos. So your circumstances are never the most important issue. A second Summary conclusion. Makes sense to me, at least. Don't seek escape from the world. Don't seek escape from the world. I mean, certainly, Scripture forbids us from living with a, a hedonistic attitude, you know. Just living by that, that motto, you know, we find in Scripture, eat, drink, and be merry, you know, for tomorrow we die, you know. Grab all the gusto you can. It used to be a commercial. But it's also true that nothing here in this passage is advocating passivity. It, it doesn't advocate an aloofness, you know, from the world. I, I think really it's still saying, get in, live. Don't go underground. Someone's been trying to make the case for, to, that, to me lately about that as our church is growing and we're even faced with expanding our property and all that, it's like, no, we shouldn't do that. You know, we need to be getting underground. You know, we got to be training our people how to escape, get away from everything. I'm going, no, that was the simple answer. No. <laughs> so get in, just don't forget the radical perspectives. 
So yes, it includes making plans, making goals, taking steps to reach them. I think Paul is a good example, the same guy that wrote it, right? He understood that he lived in this compressed period of time, and yet he talked to the people he wrote to, even the Corinthians. If you look in chapter 16, he talked to them about his own future plans to visit them. Here's what he says, chapter 16, verse 5, I will come to you. After I go through Macedonia, for I am going through Macedonia, verse 7, for I hope to remain with you for some time, if the Lord permits, he understood God's sovereignty, but I will remain in Ephesus until Pentecost. So he's got it all mapped out on his spreadsheet there, on an app, on his phone and everything. He had his plans. And he discussed the need for the Corinthians to to make some plans about a future donation they were to make, you know, to to the suffering believers in Judea. And those plans weren't going to come to fruition until two or three years later. So the radical perspectives are are not meant to make us lazy or uncaring about the world and unsympathetic about things. We're not to be indifferent. But they do help us make our goals and to take the action steps to reach those goals with the right thinking in place. Our contentment in Christ so that we're not violating our true priorities. So no matter what plans we make, what our dreams are that we have, we remember the main thing, and the main thing is that we treasure Christ over all the experiences and all the relationships and the things of this world. We make that commitment in our hearts that Joshua made so many centuries ago. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And you can have the joy of knowing what 1 Corinthians 15 verse 58 says later. What an encouragement. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is, is not in vain in the Lord. So I don't know you personally. It may be this morning that you need to hear all this from this perspective, that you, you don't know Christ. You, you need to repent, turn from trusting in yourself and relying on yourself and, and really come to entrust yourself to Christ for the forgiveness of your sin. Because I can, I'm promising you to live in this compressed time, this kairos, without knowing Christ and that your sins are forgiven. That's a fearful thing. Maybe that's your need. But if you're a true sheep of Christ, you're a true follower of Christ today, maybe it's a a reorientation that God has for you today. A reset of your values, your goals. If you don't know Christ, it's interesting, there's a verse in 2 Corinthians 6 that uses this same word, kairos. Now is the acceptable time. Now is the acceptable kairos. Behold, now is the day of salvation. If you know Christ, it's it's an opportunity to respond, to, to have this reset in your heart, a reorientation so that you're living your life with the right perspectives in mind. God is so gracious to do that in us. And if you failed in this, listen, I, I have to go back to these perspectives frequently, if not daily, in some way. I'm pretty good about making idols of things, of anything. I've perfected that, I think. This resets my heart. This is for me this morning. Because I just want to please him. Hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. You know. So you make the application that's important to where you are. God had you here for a reason today. Let's pray. Our Father, we come recognizing that we do have the chronos, and you're sovereign over that. Whatever minutes and hours and days and years that we have all come from you. They're determined. You're the eternal God, not controlled by those things, but we live in the chronos of life and It's even a chronos of of life that brought us here this morning, a a moment of of worship and study and where we're here before you, the great God of all time and eternity. So Lord, we acknowledge that. 
But we ask this of you, Lord, that you would help us to answer the question, what time is it, to answer it correctly. And we need help with that. We need you to give us the ability to let go of a, of a love affair we have with something of this world, maybe a love affair with comfort, a love affair with security, a, a love affair with our dreams and goals or people in our lives or careers or things or possessions, opinions, perspectives. Help us to let go and to love your glory than any of those things. We want to seek first your kingdom, knowing that all the other things will come to us in your will, as you will. We are so thankful for Christ and what he accomplished by his perfect life and his death, both in life and death, being obedient to you, our Heavenly Father, so that we can know forgiveness of sin, so that we can live our lives marked by eternity because we know Christ, your son, is our identity. In his name we pray, amen.